Alrighty, got disconnected. I had a phone call with Mama. So picking back up where I was sharing kind of some general timelines that I've observed or some patterns that I've observed both with meditation retreats, whether it's a 10 day Galenka or Twim, or retreats that I put on myself, whether they're just solitary or they're in darkness, and then these longer ones as well. Beforehand, I like to use ideally really some weeks of slowly just putting the intention in there. So maybe if it's, this is April right now, having an idea, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling like it could be good, could be beneficial to have a, have a retreat coming up in the next month or two. And so over these coming weeks, using the notebook and just putting down different pieces that come up. Why am I thinking to do this? What sort of benefits do I feel I come from this? Getting real clear on, on why I'm doing it. Instead of just saying, well, I want to do it, that might not work so well when I'm in, in it and temptations are coming up to stop and if I'm not really clear on, on the benefits and why. And it also, coming up with what sorts of potential challenges do I think may arise and how can I mitigate those. Preparing the mind so that those things don't just come out of the blue and even do some like visualization, imagining, okay, I'm in the dark room and these sorts of temptations may come up. Maybe it's the story that I need to get the phone because some little things that feel important but they're really not come up and I say, oh yeah, I should uh, do those, but really it's just a little temptation of restlessness or something. So over the course of days and weeks, using journaling, using um, just like brainstorming and stream of consciousness, allowing that to come up, also doing the walk and talks, like I mentioned, walking somewhere, ideally in nature for me, where there's not a lot of need for sensory engagement, like watching out for cars or talking to people so the mind can just disconnect and I'll speak out loud to myself and allow the mind to answer well what sort of challenge may arise if I'm in the dark room for several weeks and I don't have the phone okay well why would that be a challenge okay well why is that a challenge okay well how can I go about mitigating that Okay, how else can I go about mitigating that? And, uh, um, in the book, Deep Work, among other stories, the author shares about Charles Darwin as he was working on his theory of evolution, which is actually quite different from what is generally considered. It's not like the, what is it, the survival of the fittest and whatnot. Actually, what he found is that working together in communities is is one of the main ways for evolution but kind of neo-darwinism people who aren't actually connected to what he believed that's somehow kind of hijacked the name but he he had a practice of every day after lunch i think walking for hours just in a circle around this garden that he had and i'm assuming doing something similar just allowing the brain to percolate it were moving and so the mind can kind of just shut down. It's, it's the same thing over and over. So the logical mind can kind of shut down and open up access to a little more of that subconscious mind and different solutions, different answers come up. So I like to do that to prepare, get some idea then of, of what may come and why I'm doing it. Get really clear on it. If it's a big thing that I feel may be really challenging or if it's something that I have tried to do and not been fully successful as I'd like to in the past, like these big retreats, and I will write it out. First, there'll be several iterations where first is just brainstorming and then that's getting near. I'll write out a commitment where I, I say specifically what I'm committing to doing for these next, from this day until this day, I'm committing to be in this dark room and focusing on this. And I will not do this, I will do this, these are the reasons why, and signing my name to it. 
maybe even sharing with other people as a gentle sort of accountability, both for myself to have, because it's very important, I've found, to be very specific with myself about what I'm doing, because otherwise the mind has a habit of finding little ways out for most of us, not everyone. It's not like inherent, but it's one that we are often trained in or train ourselves in. So I find it very beneficial to be as specific as possible so that when those temptations come, that little gray area is very small. Then what I have found, well, I guess I'll kind of go into yeah, suggestions at the same time. So with this, for dark room specifically, and meditation retreats, and really probably every modality and every experience, my personal suggestion is to try not to have any expectations. And since that is probably going to be very difficult, since we are used to having expectations, then to try to have as few as possible and to recognize that as expectations are like a prison. The more expectations we have, then the more that the mind gets kind of locked into things that it already knows instead of being open to other possibilities. And so I may actually limit the benefit or the experience that I have because I'm so much looking for, like I said, in, in these retreat most recently, I was really wanting, I was expecting, okay, I'm going to be doing this in a dark room for so many weeks and months. I should be getting really deep and I should experience Naroda and I'm not experiencing it right now. And I should be experiencing this story of joy, super strong, but I'm not. And so I was missing the fact that I was experiencing deep joy and deep relaxation. It was just different than the expectation I had. And I was experiencing deep meditative states and mental purifying states. I just wasn't experiencing the neurota itself. And so I was kind of blowing off all of this benefit that I was getting. That's just a limitation, you know? The dark room, I haven't, I haven't met any experience, whether it's an individual meditative retreat or a psychedelic journey or some sort of conference or you know multi thousand dollar experience or coaching or anything that solves all let alone or any let alone all of my issues or my desires or brings me whatever like i have found that they all build on each other and so that's why I like to use so many small things around me such as putting those little cards to remind me of areas that I'd like to improve or whatever and being very careful about what I ingest with music and books and shows and also combining with these bigger things that are all moving in that same direction so they build on each other but letting go of the expectation that there's going to be just some massive shift it may come I've certainly experienced individual shifts from things, but having that expectation can really cause, in my own experience, to be striving, to really be trying to force it to get that desired result. And then, like I said, may miss other things, may really get burnt out and like also kind of bummed out or depressed because the mind says, oh, this thing that I'm striving for is the only thing that's worthwhile and I'm not getting it, so I'm going to be doomed in sadness forever or something like that. And so, yeah, like I said, with dark rooms initially, I was going in expecting, oh, there's going to be all this wild psychedelic experiences and who knows what. It seems so different from the general like normal thing to do that it must just bring about all this magic and it didn't and in the initial long one the first multi-month one uh yeah in the beginning i was i was after a few weeks i was really like oh man i gotta do something that's why i did i had different psychedelic experiences inside of it because i was trying to force it basically and I was doing Dr. Joe Dispenza, kind of trying to open the Kundalini and come on, please, all this. I'm so grateful that I didn't because I was not prepared for an open Kundalini. I had no teachers, I know nothing about it, and that can put someone in a really challenging physical and psychological 
place. So I'm grateful for it, that I didn't, but I was really feeling that craving for it. This is actually a millet, a millet like shake. And this is a millet halva. Halva being a type of Indian sort of sweet. And I'm at this local organic restaurant slash store in Mysore. Quite nice and they have tons of millet, interestingly enough, using all different kinds of millet for things. So along with that, I would say perspective is very important. What sort of perspective we take. It can be very easy when we're doing something that is new and that many, not many people that we know have done, such as a dark retreat, to take the perspective of, oh, this is so hardcore, this is going to be so intense, this is such a big deal. I'm going to be so, watching the words that we use, especially in the mind, oh, I'm going to be struggling so much, oh, I'm going to need so much help, or, oh, I'm really going to be trying really hard, and hopefully I can make it through, and these sorts of things. Well, that perspective just sets it up to have a challenging time because we believe it's going to be challenging and so when things happen such as like i said the natural up and down of emotions over a week or a month now i'm seeing it from the perspective of oh that must be due to doing this super hardcore thing of a dark room and i can't believe it's so intense when in fact it's actually probably very similar to what we experience in the day today but that perspective demotivates or vice versa it can be much more much more empowering of yeah this is going to be an incredible experience and i'm going to be conscious of reality there's probably a good possibility some of it's going to be challenging i've never been in a dark room before for multiple days with myself and i do have habits of using the phone and with friends or with my children or with my partner to kind of avoid emotions so there's the possibility of some challenges because I'm not so experienced yet with being with myself but it's also going to be really incredible like I finally get to have this experience of really disconnecting and really just resting the mind and the body because I'm not taking in any new information from the eyes I'm not talking with anyone for days and I can just rest and shut down for a bit and I don't need to have the nervous system on high alert all the time. It's probably going to be really relaxing and it's going to be really insightful because I'm going to learn things about myself. Not to mention just I mean, what a gift it is that I get to do this, which well over 7 billion people in the world won't even know exists dark rooms, let alone be able to do it. And I get to do it. Wow, this is going to be a real special experience and having that attitude going in can really assist when during days or weeks into it and it's like oh i just want it to be done some some old patterns of you know restlessness or boredom or whatever i'm so tired of this or whatever and remember actually this is an incredibly rare opportunity that i have right now and i get to experience all of these other things that i almost never experience what a blessing so having a nice perspective, being really aware of that perspective, that's another suggestion. In general, I say take it slow. Um, no need to jump in. I, I did go from seven days to you know, several months, and that's a pretty big jump in some ways. But I had years of practice you know, I've been in lots of intense experiences in the Marine Corps. And for years, since I remember, even in teenage years, I've been putting myself in intense experiences intentionally to, to grow and let go of those reactions. Like in the Western world, they would probably call it stoicism or something like that. But I wasn't familiar with that term, really. Um, so I had been practicing that a lot. And then I also had several years of dozens of intense psychedelic journeys so i would had a lot of practice being with the mind 
when it's experiencing different sorts of challenges. And then I'd also, by the time I had this long dark retreat, that's mid 2020. So that's over two and a half years of almost 100% dedication to personal development and to personal evolution and to building this relationship with myself, to letting go of reactivity, to letting go of fear and lots of work I have done with fear and letting it go. So it wasn't something that I just jumped into without background. My suggestion would be to take it, definitely take things slow, not only because there can be real challenges that come if one is not prepared or even if one is prepared. And so there's no need to, to force things when, again, the bigger picture, the macro picture, what's, the, what's my desired end state? My desired end state is not to complete some month in darkroom. That doesn't really do anything for me. My desired end state is to do whatever I'm doing in a way that I evolve as a person so I become more happy, more at peace, and more content. So if I'm doing something that is actually pushing me too far, then I'm not going to be at peace, I'm gonna be on edge and I'm gonna be struggling. Well, that's not meeting my desired end state. And it can be easy, especially in the world of accomplishment, where we think the more things that I do or the more hardcore things that I do, that's going to just that's magically makes me better and so let me just read all these books and listen to podcasts 24 7 without really you know ingesting deeply any of this information taking notes or refreshing on it or studying it just like let me just consume 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 and do the same thing with with experiences which i have done a lot of trust me um i did lots of consumption spirituality or consumption consciousness which is it's pretty common. Um, Cause that's just how we've, we've done it. But the bigger picture for me is building these healthy, positive habits that are gonna assist me long-term. And so if I'm doing something based out of fear of time running out and I gotta, I gotta jump right into it, I don't have any time, I'm, I'm 35 years old, I gotta go do everything cause I'm running out of time. So let me go jump into three weeks in a dark room instead of doing a three day and a seven day and a 12 day. Well, then that's just reinforcing the bigger pattern, which is harming me more of squeezing things in and not being at peace. So take it slow would be my suggestion. Let's see how much time we have. Um, next one is about stacking. Now, stacking is a term I think it's widely used, at least like in the life hacker world, of combining multiple experiences or multiple substances or multiple whatever. Um, and I have used it a lot, sometimes for benefit and sometimes for harm. So an example of, of a big stack, for example, what I did one time in 2019 as I went to I had the big Tony Robbins experience coming up, Date With Destiny. So like a week before that, I had a week-long Iboga retreat out of the country, which is a powerful psychedelic. And it's been shown to really improve or increase neuroplasticity in the brain. So increase the brain's ability to learn new things and to change habits and patterns for weeks and months after ingesting that substance so my intention was one the benefit of the psychedelic experience itself but also to adjust my neurons and get them prepared to learn more so i then i went almost directly from there to tony robbins experience which is very big and you know that's a huge stack place in itself there combining the energy of thousands of people plus music and lights and the type of teaching and whatever so you're working on breaking through and making new huge goals and all of that while there i also ingested several substances which are known to be empathogens or help you connect with people and feel these emotions even stronger um, 
I think I fasted one or two of the days, which is shown to also bring mental clarity and energy. And during, you know, I would be doing breathing exercises and things that get the energy really up, whatnot. Um, then I, when that was done, I drove in my truck like a day or so. And during that time, I'm doing audio journaling to where I get where a uh, place in New Mexico where there are some meditation caves and I stayed in there for a couple days while I'm re-listening to those audio journalings and I'm doing other sorts of practices and things and I'm walking in the nature, doing walk and talk over and over. And then directly from there, I went home for Christmas where my parents were, my family were, and I went to different places that I'd been in childhood that had different either positive or challenging memories and I was using these tools from Tony to re-change the relationships with them and to improve relationships with family or things like that. And I'm sure there was many other things going on at that time, but that was like an extended period of a couple weeks with multiple layers doing things on top of things on top of things. And probably that benefited in different ways, though it can be easy to get into just like I said the, the thinking that well the more I do the better and not reinforcing a pattern that's not beneficial because it's not like that I'm I'm trying to get to the place of being at peace and relaxed and not doing anything well how am I gonna get there if my plan to get there is to keep doing more things to get to that place it certainly makes sense similar like uh, Bhante Ananda, one thing he said is he's talking about different types of meditation and why he prioritizes um, feeling good, feeling joy, feeling relaxed in TWIM. He had been practicing a different type of meditation where it's about kind of being with the pain and really pushing through and being with it and sucking it up. And he said it, it doesn't really make sense if the Buddha was teaching how to get to a place that is at peace and free of mental and physical pain, it doesn't really make sense to take on mental and physical pain in order to get to that place that's free of mental and physical pain. Similarly like this, if, if my desired end state is to be at peace with whatever happens and not need lots of external things, well, there may be times in the beginning especially where those can help me get out of some patterns, but if it's been years and I'm still just stacking a bunch of stuff, maybe time to review that. And an example of where stacks have not been beneficial is the dark retreat that I did at the end of 2021 where I was intending to do three or a month, but I chose to do a long dry fast as well. And I didn't know then. I had experience with dry fasting and I had been communicating with Dr. Filanov, who's a Russian doctor, who's the leading expert on dry fasting that I know of. And I've seen, I have multiple friends now who have had Lyme disease uh, to the extent of in wheelchair for years or even more than a decade. And now I know some that are near 100%, some that are riding bicycle and things. And he uses dry fasting for cancer and diabetes and all kinds of viruses I and mean, COVID, of course. Um, so I had some experience with dry fasting, but not enough. And I didn't realize that really during a dry fast, you want to be moving a lot because that helps some of these processes going on in the body, taking in lots of oxygen because the, the body takes in that oxygen, breaks it down. And then with the fat that's being broken down from the fasting, it creates its own water inside the body. It's known as intracellular water. Um, so in a dark room, not moving a lot. And blood gets pretty thick during a dry fast. And so it did. And I got, uh, I wasn't moving much. I'm sitting a lot. And I didn't have very good airflow in the dark room that I was in. And so my left leg became nearly fully paralyzed, probably like 85% paralyzed. And after a handful of days like this, finally I decided, okay, I'm gonna call this one after a little 22 days. And I went outside of the dark room and you know, 
know, got some work on it and movement and stuff. But that was, you know, that's a perfect example of letting the staff or whatever take priority to the actual thing that's more important, which the more important thing was to have a month of meditation and get that personality change. But instead, I got so focused on the stacking and the doing that I prioritized that and that subsequently knocked off eight days of meditation and the meditation that I did have was not nearly as deep because my body was physically and psychologically challenged, especially when there's the like leg paralyzation and things. So my suggestion would be to probably limit the stacking, especially in the beginning times of any sort of experience. S similar with a meditation retreat or something, don't, my suggestion is don't combine the psychedelics or fasting at least for the first several and especially if they say don't then like uh you know it's not really beneficial to be in a meditation retreat where we're breaking a preset by lying just so we feel because we feel this craving to like do more stuff but at least i like to get an idea of a clear baseline of how do I feel with this practice or with whatever it is without confusing and confounding the data by having doing multiple things and so I don't really know well are these results due to the main thing that I was interested in of the meditation or the whatever or is it due to these other things that I'm doing which may be adjusting it in ways I don't really realize because I'm looking for results and so if I'm doing a bunch of different things it's hard to get clear on which is giving me the results and then how do I repeat that that's one suggestion the exercise I, I touched on I think that exercise is yeah, it's, it's a good thing, <laughs> you know? I think we know that it releases all kinds of different neurochemicals and boosts the mood and helps out the, the physical body a lot, helps to digest food. Bhante Ananda and others, they're very adamant about the fact of, Bhante Vimala Ramzi, very adamant about once sitting in longer meditations to move the body actively, to get the heart pumping so that if we're sitting for tens of hours a day and not moving then blood clots can occur or just getting sluggish physically and mentally so i would like i said i would walk in the hallways or i would just walk in place relaxed or sometimes i would run 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 in place do push-ups run in place do push-ups get the heart pumping and that would often change my mood a bit often at in the dark room like i said i will feel pretty tranquil and just kind of like I don't really feel like pushing myself much in a good way often because historically I've pushed myself a lot uh, but sometimes it can get a little bit sluggish and to just get some movement get some going that can that can kind of change the attitude and that can subsequently change the meditation itself going deeper going deeper with things um, hmm. Okie dokie dilio. The practice, the practice, having a practice when going into the dark room. Clearly, currently, I'm very focused on exploring Twim. Who knows? I'm open to Twim not being the one that I'm with forever. Um, I'm not even going to give you know, any sort of results right now because I've been practicing TWIM since August. So that is around seven, eight months. And I've done several hour, thousand hours now with five, or five, 10 days and, and this multi-month. But most of my time with TWIM has been in retreat or something like that. So I can't really tell how it's impacting me in the longer term and in the bigger world of interacting with other humans and with myself in situations that are outside of the retreat context. So I can't say, so who knows if I'll continue with TWIM after this year test or not, but having this practice 
has really assisted me in getting more benefit out of. Like I said, there's going to be some benefit of just being in the environment of the dark room and having to be with the mind and having to be with these unconscious patterns and things for sure. But why not? This is where a nice stack would be. Yeah, being in the dark room and just going through days, that's one thing. But a, a nice stack, simple stack, is have a practice that is going to multiply the benefit effect. Benef beneficial effects so I won't tell much more about practices having access to a teacher or to some someone who's ideally experienced in the practice but in the least who's a really positive conscious supporter or ally uh, like I said I've done it where I don't talk to anyone, basically, and there is definite benefit in that. Hey. But then this time around and moving forward, at least for recent coming ones, I would have access to some friends or allies who are aligned in case there's just, yeah, just getting burnt out or need some guidance on the practice itself or on other challenges that may come up. But at the same time, limiting that to where there is definitely great benefit that comes from being in situations where the emotions feel, feel so lonely or I feel so depressed or whatever. And we being so used to having some sort of escape mechanism to avoid those. And that's often by interacting with other people, whether it's through social media or, or directly, and not avoiding those and getting to see firsthand that, oh, actually, this is really not that big of a deal. Like these emotions, I've just had some story about them, but they're really not that big of a deal because I was with it for days and it felt like I was just going to, oh, I can't take this anymore. And then finally, I got tired of feeling like I can't take this anymore and I just stopped and I realized, oh, actually I'm feeling really good. I'm feeling really enjoying this. So there's definite benefit with that as well. Um, with that, the in preparation before and post, uh, I am cautious or careful, intentional, about who I share my intentions to do something like this with and who I share with after. Now, obviously, right now I'm posting this to YouTube and I'm sharing with many people that I know. And I'm doing this now, it's probably like five, six years into this journey. So I feel comfortable with where I'm at to be able to do this, but I wouldn't have recommended this to myself if I was just a couple of years into this journey because initially on this journey, it can feel pretty confusing and scary and challenging to go into changing the way that we act and think and changing our values and our priorities when it seems like everyone around us is still going in one way and we're starting to go this other way. And so during those initial months and years, really stewarding ourselves very carefully so that we don't, because if I'm just, you know, let's say I've just deleted the news app on my phone and I'm, I'm recognizing like, oh, I'm actually, in some way feeling a little less stress from checking the news and I share that with someone that I respect and they say something like which I've experienced when back years back man you're that's like really it's almost like disrespectful you're not staying what's the word um, informed and you're in the military you should you should stay informed this is Kind of like one of your responsibilities to do this and I basically not supportive and I wasn't at the place yet where I had enough relationship with myself to know yeah that doesn't resonate 
I feel better without the news app. And this other story of like being well informed, that's not really real, it seems. Like, why do I need to know about things that are outside of my control? And that seems generally largely focused on negativity. I didn't have that yet. And so subsequently, I was like, yeah, he's right. I have this obligation. That's what it, whenever I hear the mind saying there's an obligation, I immediately look into that one deeper because so far I haven't found any time in my life or others where obligation is a positive thing. It usually seems, pretty much always seems to be something that is negative. That is, I'm doing something that doesn't actually feel aligned, but I'm doing due to some story from society or family or friends or something that I've read or whatever that I feel like this is the right way, even though it doesn't feel aligned to me. So that's what I did with the news. And I went back to several more years of being ingesting all that negativity so similar with something like this uh, in the early days also we may not yet have a community that's really aligned with where we're going and so we may be with family and friends who care for us but they have slightly different values and they have slightly different historical experiences so they may not recognize the benefit of these sorts of things especially when they seem really outside the box uh, or, you know, against societal conditioning, such as using a psychedelic in a positive, intentional way, well, that's a drug, or that's illegal, and that makes people go crazy, or any of these sorts of stories that I myself used to think because I was uninformed, or similar with a darkroom, well, why would you do that? What's wrong with you? Are you selfish? You just want to be by yourself, or that's going to make you go crazy? Are you... Are you like are you crazy things like this to get that before get that energy before going into something that is already going to be intense and stretch us that can be a real demotivator going into something with low motivation and then also in there when some sort of experience arises and that voice being in the back and be like oh maybe they were right they were i'm going crazy i gotta get out of here that's not that ideal However, if we do have community that are aligned and supportive, then having a few of those, sharing with a few of them, and them saying, I got your back, much love. In the first long dark retreat, I shared with, I didn't share specifically what I was doing, but I shared with probably a dozen some people that are strong allies, friends and family. I shared, hey, I'm going to be going offline here for several months and I'm going to be doing something that I've never done before and I think is going to have periods that are really intense. And I would appreciate if you would take some photo of me and put it somewhere where you'll see it daily and just think something positive about me. And I'm going to be thinking about y'all because y'all are people that are really close to me. I care for you and I know you're supporters of me and I support you. And so I did that every day in the darkroom. Uh, the previous time I would go through them and I would be sending them positivity and gratitude and appreciation and it also helped me when there were times of temptation of maybe I should leave or maybe I should you know kind of not really do this fully to know that they knew that I was doing something and to know that when I got back on the phone and things they would be in some way wondering how did it go and so that gave me a little bit of accountability and similarly afterwards to be careful with who we share with because it can feel really i mean you just did your first week in darkness or just fasted for the first time for some days or something like that congratulations you know that's awesome and it it really opens up in my experience really opens up my definition of who i am when i realize oh i could I can survive for five days without any food. Wow, that just expanded my definition of who I thought I was. It just opened up new possibilities for me. And those impact all kinds of ways that aren't like linear and you can't really see how that will be. So feel good, feel excited, feel amazed, and also want to share with others and can go out and start sharing with people who aren't at the place to where they can really appreciate that they may feel threatened by it because it may shine a light onto certain areas of challenge that they have 
or they may just be closed-minded to it and so they just poo-poo it or it just may not be where they're at and so they're just kind of like yeah big deal and that can kind of poke the balloon and let out the air and subsequently we, we especially in the beginning before we have real sensitivity to how these things impact us because it can be very subtle the experiences in a dark room are generally very very subtle but it's compounding thousands of these very subtle things and it's slowly slowly changing so before we get that sort of sensitivity to how they're improving or beneficially impacting us we can come out and we're feeling all positive and we say something to these people and maybe they say yeah i don't think so i think that you know like that's not really real or yeah whatever it doesn't really matter or something and we can start doubting it and placebo effect is real and the integration period after any experience is as important as the experience itself that's when the real results come is in the days and weeks and months after the experience we can get a great experience and it does great things during the retreat but if we're not able to integrate that into day-to-day -day life it has limited benefit and so if in that integration period we get some really demotivating disempowering feedback from people then our mind can start going into the placebo effect of thinking yeah probably wasn't that big of a deal maybe i did make this all up and maybe these people are just you know woo woo and whatever and yeah i don't really need to do it anymore and they're right i should go back to live in this other way so that would be something that i yeah i, I a recommendation and also the bigger picture is it doesn't really matter we're probably not going to only tell people who are totally supportive some people are probably going to be less than supportive maybe even in positive ways because they're going to provide constructive criticism and so i can just accept that that's going to happen instead of making a big deal out of it and you know feeling bothered or upset at them or upset at myself that i did talk to them or whatever like that so I'll end this one and then I'll continue with some more thoughts and suggestions.